everybody it's dr rick dropping in on you first and foremost want to wish everybody a happy new year i uh, hope that you have gotten off uh, to a great start feet on the ground moving towards whatever it is you're moving towards i hope that you got to enjoy yourself those that celebrated last night i hope everybody made it in safe uh look you know the routine, and I don't want it to be routine. I want it to everything to matter. But you know the routine. If you uh, like what you like and see, uh, like what you see in here, here, click the like button, click the share button, subscribe. Uh, for those of you who have followed some time, those of you who have been around long enough to know the work we do in the community, that that work is so prevalent. It's so immensely important uh, to the progress that we say that we want. Uh, but we make very little uh, movement toward. It's so prevalent and we need your support. Look in the description box and support the work. We have a research center that has cataloged more than 100 plus thousand hours, 80 of which I've contributed to myself. Uh, we've produced programs in the inner city. We have advocated for children in uh, public schools, advocated for children and adults uh, caught up in the penal system. Uh, mental health awareness, uh, intimate partner violence, so much we need your support. Now, I'm going to move on to this because I don't have a whole lot of time and I want to give it enough attention. Um, as you know, today is the first uh, two get the first two games of the college playoffs. So we got the semifinals where four teams are going to play each other to see who plays each other next week for the national championship, college football and all of that. And it's a big hoopla. And the championship game is going to be played right here in Houston. So there's a lot of conversation going on. Um, and the guys that I spend my time around when I'm not working, uh, outside of being extremely busy, business savvy and so much more are big sports fans. So we have these conversations all the time. But from uh, probably differing viewpoints than the average person, and here, here we are right now. And what I want to talk about is something that I saw that I'm not surprised by, but I think it needs to be addressed. And that is the quarterback of Alabama, an African-American male, uh, let me state, from uh, H-Town. They keep coming here and getting them uh, from the H-Town area. Um, so was Jalen Hurts, by the way. Uh, and so he says that when he when he was when he first arrived and he was preparing and um, to play and uh, he said Bill O'Brien. Uh, for those of you who the name may sound familiar to, but you can't quite place it, Bill O'Brien was at one point the offensive coordinator for um, Bill Belichick doing some of the championship runs and on that got chances to coach at uh, the head coach level and totally destroyed the Houston Texans. Uh, traded DeAndre Hopkins, let uh, J.J. Watt go, uh, basically alienated uh, Deshaun Watson and totally took a, te a team that was on the verge to the brink. And it's amazing that uh, that team is back so quickly. While I'm not a traditional fan in the sense that I am definitely not emotionally involved in sport where I'm arguing with anybody, getting upset when the team loses and all that. I have a favorite team. It's the 49ers. But my default team will always be my home team. I will never cheer root against the home squad. So I like the Texans and I, you know, uh, cheer for the Texans to win when they play. But to watch those guys, man, who were basically the faces of the franchise be ran off because Bill O'Brien has a major ego issue. He's also a very uh, entrenched bigot. And I use the term bigot in uh, distinction to racist. Racist talks to the power. And racism is involved because there's a power element and a sense of privilege invoked in this. But this is bigotry. What Bill O'Brien told this kid was that he wasn't a quarterback, that he should look at, think about playing some other position because he wasn't going to be good enough to play uh, quarterback at the college level. This kid is now one of the best quarterbacks in the country. The numbers speak for themselves. He's led his team after 
one rookie, rocky game, he's led his team to the national playoffs. Um, despite whether you believe Alabama should be in there or not, there's a whole lot of politics and all that stuff, but the kid delivered on the field in some pretty spectacular ways. But the kid was being interviewed, and it's in hindsight now, and he's made it, and he's smiling. Uh, but the one of the reporters asked him, how did it make you feel? And he said, how would you feel if I told you you, you suck? And he said, I feel pretty horrible. He says, well, that's how I felt. Now, you got to think these kids are at this time, but see, this isn't just about Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien is a bigoted asshole. He's crap. And this is about a long-lived stereotype that black quarterbacks could play at the highest levels. And the argument was always along the line is that they weren't smart enough. They were athletic enough, um, but they would always find something wrong with the mechanics, but they would always lean back to they couldn't process. And the, and the thing is, what was actually the truth is that the people who were attempting to coach these kids had been pigeonholed into the notion or idea that the ball game could only be played the way that white quarterbacks had always played it. They hadn't become innovated in their thinking. They had not developed or determined how they could use the unique skill sets of these highly athletic individuals who still wanted to play quarterback because quarterback wasn't generally something that was played by extremely athletic people. And so, you know, Warren Moon spent five plus years in the Canadian Football League, one of the most prolific passers in NFL history was not even drafted as a quarterback. He had to go to the uh, the CFL and prove his worth, won five uh, Edmonton Cups up there, which is the uh, equivalent to the Super Bowl. And this is the thing. So over and over again, you're hearing over and over again that they can't do it. And so now you're getting the Randall Cunningham's, well, it started with Doug Williams, but he was considered an anomaly. And then you had Randall Cun Cunningham. He was considered a freak of nature. There was always an explanation why a black quarterback succeeded in the NFL. And then you got the Michael Vick, and he was the phenomenon. Uh, nobody could run a 4-2-40 and throw a ball a whole football field. So he wasn't going to be the stereotypical black quarterback. He was just special. And then all of a sudden, you start to get the uh, the Donovan McNabbs, the... Um, oh, God, can't think of the kid in Minnesota right now. Uh, that threw Randy Moss all the touchdowns. It'll come to me. But what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is it wasn't a sense that black quarterbacks had to catch up to the game. It was that coaches had to catch up to black quarterbacks. Uh, that goes all the way back to the argument of black inferiority, something that was pushed heavily in uh, the late 70s and early 90s. Uh, they even tried to say that it was scientifically backed, but it was proven wrong. Matter of fact, I am here because of uh, a personal present argument by Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, which pushed me into the field of psychology. Uh, I was leaning towards psychology of our law, but watching Dr. Welsing on the Phil Donahue show right on the butt or the heel of this argument of intellect, black intellectual inferiority, totally manhandled her white male uh, peers, uh, just really pushed me into it. So there's been this constant, consistent suggestion that blacks aren't as smart as whites. And basically what you find when they keep trying to make that argument that black quarterbacks aren't uh, as good as white quarterbacks and it's they, they use veiled terminology to say it pocket passer versus mobile quarterback white quarterback versus black quarterback um, and reading through progressions versus being a person who extends plays in other words only a white quarterback can go through four progressions and then make the right choice. Uh, whereas in a black quarterback after the first couple of progressions is just gonna take off and run. 
uh, instead of saying, well, how can we use the creativity and the athleticism? Is there a time that you should actually say, hey, there's a big ass opening instead of me going through progressions? I see the first down. Why don't I just take it? Uh, and, and, and so what you have is now some offensive coordinators, some play callers, some play designers uh, that are willing to say there's something special here let's use it let's work with it let's lean into it and what we're seeing is now that there's this large uh surging of black quarterbacks in the nfl and that at the top of the list is lamar jackson uh which to me this kid reminds me of uh, he may not have the arm strength of lamar jackson or the absolute speed of lamar but he reminds me of lamar uh, and and so you 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 have Lamar Jackson who will more than likely or at least is deserving of the MVP this year. He's absolutely phenomenal. And obviously, being a 49er fan, I wanted one of the 49ers. Two are actually on the list for MVP: uh, Brock Purdy and Christian McCaffrey. You know, love for a 49er to get it. But the honest to God truth is, there's nobody close to, 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 to what this dude is doing, uh, Lamar Jackson. But he's not the only one, man. You got Tyrod Taylor that is almost 40 and he's still uh given the giants who are horrible a chance to win in games they shouldn't even be in uh and you can go on down the line patrick mahomes um uh geno smith's resurgence in seattle and you can just look at what you know what, what what's being done in these places where it was once thought we didn't belong and no, I'm not here just to have this treatise on sports. Obviously, anybody knows me. No, I'm going somewhere with this. The NFL is simply a microcosm of society. And what we have to do is we have to protect our children from the suggestion of inferiority in any area, not just intellectual inferiority, but inferiority in anywhere. The idea that somebody is superior to them solely because of their race has to be addressed early on. That's why I'm real big on socializing our children, especially young black males who are going to be challenged more than anyone else on this planet as to who their identity is and what their place is in this world. It is our responsibility to ensure that they know who they are, not be subjected to the suggestions of someone who doesn't have their best interest at heart. It wasn't uh, a problem with the skill set. What Bill O'Brien was unwilling to do is say, I don't have the intellectual capacity. I don't have the creativity. I don't have the open-mindedness to sculpt an offense around you. So I need you to move aside so I can find someone with the limitations that I'm used to that I can play and, and, and continue to coach and continue to look good because your instincts will move you in places that I don't know what to do with you with. And see, that's the beauty of this thing. We are instinctively exceptional at this. There's a reason why we make up 70 plus percent of the population in the NFL. We are gifted. We are not just athletic. We are gifted. We're smart. We're tenacious. We have went through some things and gone through some things that the average person that doesn't look like us haven't, hasn't gone through. And my thing is what are we doing are we are we going to sit around my whole thing is on a bigger scope on a grander scope why aren't we looking for ways to give our kids opportunities where they don't have to be subjected to white opinion not this early in life why aren't we creating this we make up 70 percent of the population in two the two most popular sports on this on this in this country and that is uh, football, American football and basketball. We we make up seventy percent of the pop, seventy plus percent of the population in both of those leagues, and we absolutely have no power and ownership. A little bit more presence, even though Michael Jordan sold sold his majority ownership, and I think Magic may have still have a mi minority ownership in the Lakers. Not sure, but that's about it. In the NFL, absolutely zilch. Uh, I think there may be some minority players hidden behind the screens, but I'm talking about major ownerships where you have influence. Uh, and the thing is, they don't let you do it. Do what The Rock did. The Rock created his own freaking league. Then merged his league with another league. I mean, that, that that's the thing I'm talking about. We have to create when we have an opportunity. We have 
uh, the first actual billionaire athlete in, ba in in the sport that became a billionaire in basketball um, while still playing in LeBron James. You have Michael Jordan, who's another billionaire, former athlete. You have Magic, Magic Johnson, who's approaching billionaire status. You have all these people, and you have such little ownership. Magic got his ownership in the NFL. Like I said, he's a minority partner uh, but uh, with the Washington Commanders. But the thing is, we need to really truly look at what we're doing and what we're investing in on a small scale and on a large scale. We're spending way too much money in their economy. We're financing our own demise by our consumerism. We are buying into their products so that they can take the power we give them through the money we spend with them and use it to oppress us. We at some point have to be be aware of this. I've said this so many times that we are where we are because we refuse to gain an understanding of what how things work. And until we do that, we will continue to be at the mercy of our oppressors. But I just had to talk about that, man. I'm wishing this kid the best of uh, luck in his career. And here's the beautiful thing about it, though. Although I have uh, a number of degrees you know, it is what it is. I have never been one to say that you have to have that in order to be exceptional, to uh, in order for your intellect to be acknowledged, in order for you to be brilliant. None of that stuff is a requirement. I chose to do it just to prove I could and to open certain doors. They wouldn't let me in unless I had it, but I never did it for them to control my destiny. That's why I own my own businesses. That's why I take my bumps and my bruises because I control my destiny. No one can tell me who I am, what I am, and what I can and cannot do. But here's the thing. You have got, we've got to do a, a lot more of building and growing and becoming. And, but this kid got his business degree in three years. So the whole idea that he's not smart enough and he did it at the University of Alabama. So with that being said, look, I'm gonna get, get out of here. Like I said previously, if you believe in the work we're doing, uh, if you believe in the research, the programs, the access to resources, the advocacy, and so much more, show your love, show your support, and support us financially. We need that. Uh, click the like button, click the share button. Let's do things. On that note, I am out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day.